all premium, elevated, and mood inspiring. So here's how it works. Choose one deodorant pod in your choice of scent, plus one case in your choice of colors. Then after 30 days, you'll get a three deodorant pod refill delivered straight to your door, conveniently timed for when you're about to run out. You can mix and match the scents, press pause, or cancel anytime. To get started with 50% off your first order, go to mymyro.com forward slash warbaby and use promo code warbaby and your first order is only five bucks. Myro is vegan, cruelty-free, gluten-free, and soy-free with no aluminum, parabens, talc, mineral oil, or triclosan. Because doing good, feeling good, and smelling good should be an everyday thing, just like deodorant. There's no way I could get through an Arizona summer without my Myro in Solar Flare. It has bacteria neutralizing citrus and probiotics that keep me smelling great. Plus, it has a cute and sturdy case I can toss in my bag and keep with me all the time. To see for yourself and get 50% off your first order, go to mymyro.com forward slash warbaby, use promo code warbaby, and get your first order for only $5. Because Myro believes a good scent and a good mood go together. Good for you and the planet we live on. 16-year-old Jessica Burlew was taken into custody and was eventually charged as an adult with second-degree murder. The charge of second-degree murder resulted in automatic trial as an adult. There would be no discretionary judgment as to whether juvenile court would be more appropriate. Jesse's case gave rise to a grassroots advocacy campaign, Free Jesse B., who supported her cause by lobbying for her charge to be reduced to manslaughter. At least with manslaughter, the possibility existed for rehabilitation and treatment within the juvenile system. However, the state of Arizona contended that, given the nature of the crime, there was little question that Jesse would be tried as an adult, regardless of her charge. The Free Jesse B. group also aimed to reframe the perception of this case. I mean, honestly, how could a 16-year-old legally, ethically, or morally even have a 43-year-old boyfriend, especially in a state where the legal age of consent is 18? But when the elder of the pair is dead by the minor's hand, the circumstances seem to blur the backstory. The murder of 43-year-old Jason Ash cannot be denied, Nor can it be denied that he was a victim, the victim of his 16-year-old lover, who didn't stop choking him because he didn't say the safe word. It's likely that Jesse was too inexperienced and naive to recognize that Jason was in serious peril. Forensic evidence indicated that Jason Ash died without putting up a struggle. The bedding was in their appropriate places, and it did not appear that Jason had even raised his hands to clutch at the extension cord looped twice around his neck. Prosecutor Jay Rademacher said that the state acknowledges the substantial mitigating factors, her upbringing, her mental health problems, the drugs. However, there are other factors to consider. The defendant was engaged in adult activities and she needs to face adult consequences. I understand the age of consent, but this defendant lied about her age. She initiated a lot of the drugs, mutilation, and sex. He said it was a recipe for disaster. This wasn't an accident, he said, because at the end of the day, Jessica was holding the cord around his neck, and she killed him. The prosecutor didn't buy that Jason Ash was a child molester or predator of underage girls, and he says it's because of the evidence he found on their phones. If you look at the text, he says, they don't paint a picture of a child molester. Jason seemed like a little puppy dog that would do anything for Jessica. The text the prosecutor is referring to include Jesse soliciting drugs from Jason and one specifically asking if he could get her a gram of heroin. Other texts, he asserts, reflect the fact that she is the aggressor and not necessarily a child being groomed. 
Perhaps, however, the most damning evidence retrieved from Jesse's phone were the many video clips made by the teen, many including Jason Ash. One clip shows Jesse hogtied with one extension cord, a gag secured in her mouth with another one. A different video shows Jesse and an unseen male smoking meth from a glass pipe, but most shockingly, was a four-minute video shot seemingly just after Jason died. The viewer can see him lying face up and seemingly fully clothed in Jessica Burlew's bed. When the clip begins, you can see a close-up of Jason's face, but then she pulls back and he appears to be already dead. Then Jesse begins to cut him with a razor blade, down his cheeks and neck, on his arms and hands. She unfastened his khaki pants and used the razor blade to inflict numerous cuts to Jason's groin and genitals. Only then, after Jason lay dead from strangulation, with the extension cord still looped around his neck and blood all over the walls, beds, and herself, did Jesse call her mother for help. Jessica and Jason's online profiles on various platforms show they each had tastes that veered toward the darker side. Posts on his Facebook page include song lyric quotes such as, I like to dissect girls, did you know I'm utterly insane? And, your throat, I take grasp, can you feel the pain? His cover photo is a musician with sewed up lips and a mask covered in bloody scars. At a status conference in mid-August 2015, the state of Arizona laid a potential plea agreement in front of the defense. Plead guilty to manslaughter, and they'd recommend a sentence of 10 years in prison. The maximum sentence Jesse could face at trial was 25 years. Advocates pushed for a sentence of time served. Second-degree murder is generally reserved for cases where there is intent, but no premeditation, whereas manslaughter or negligent homicide is usually more appropriate in an accidental death. When Jesse accepted the plea deal in September 2015, it was a deal for second-degree murder, not manslaughter as the defense had been led to believe. The recommendation of a 10-year sentence would stand but the judge could sentence Jesse to a maximum of 25 years. When formally sentenced in October of 2015, Jesse's public defender said, He was 43, she was 16, both are victims of different crimes. She referred to Jesse's plea deal as the best and final offer and implored the judge to consider the following when sentencing. She was 16 years old. She had no prior felonies. She did not possess the capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of her actions due to the drugs that Jason Ash had given her. She had an extensive history of substance abuse. She had a dysfunctional childhood. She had significant mental health issues. She was engaged in an inappropriate relationship. Jason's death was the result of a consensual act and not premeditated murder. When handing down the sentence, Judge McCoy said, I know there's been a great deal of debate about this case, but today is not the day for debate. Despite the very unusual circumstances of this case, there are a considerable amount of mitigating factors so much so that it justifies reducing the sentence down to 10 years. Jason Ash's mother, Marcia, made a statement commenting that he wasn't perfect and didn't always make the best choices, but that he was not a pedophile or a sexual predator. Marcia understood that Jesse fell through the cracks of society, but that her mother, Tracy, does not escape blame. There are two victims here, she said. One is named Jason, and the other is named Jessica. The system failed her. 
Marcia conceded that the strangulation could be seen as an accident, however was adamant that the unimaginably horrific post-mortem mutilation her son endured could be no accident. When given the chance to speak, Jesse said, He also lied about his age. He said he was 26 on the internet site where we met. Then he said he was 28. He kept saying he was 28, and I believed it. By the time she was sentenced, Jesse Burlew had been incarcerated for 644 days, almost all of which was entirely spent in solitary confinement. This was typical for about a quarter of juvenile pretrial defendants in Arizona prisons, which the ACLU deemed cruel and unusual. In 2014, the ACLU sent a letter to the sheriff's office saying there is a growing consensus among courts, policymakers, and the medical community that the isolation of juveniles, especially those with mental health conditions, violates basic standards of human decency. A staff attorney from the ACLU of Arizona told the Phoenix New Times that the conditions of Jessica's confinement are deplorable for any juvenile, but they are particularly horrible in Jessica's case because of her extensive history of mental illness. No juvenile pretrial detainee should be confined to a cell for up to 23 hours a day, denied proper medical and mental health care, or be subjected to contact with convicted adults. Maricopa County must provide better care to juveniles in their custody. As a juvenile in adult prison, Jesse did not have access to counseling, education, or consistent, proper dosages of medications required to treat her mental illness and behavioral issues. When asked for a statement, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office said that Inmate Burlew is a closed custody inmate, which is the highest security classification in our jail system. Inmates in closed custody are locked down in their cells for 23 hours a day, with only one hour out. I'll leave you with this poem Jesse wrote while in jail called A Cry for Help. Looking back at all the memories, Slit my vein, let my pain ease. How am I supposed to be myself, with all these scars to remind me? Hold my breath, I forgot to breathe. Hold my soul in patches of weeds. Dried out, withered, and decapitated. No love, no hate. I'm self-made. The things I used to love, all came to a blur. These last few years seem like decades. The things I would miss most, I don't care about anymore. Loathsome, no one cares, why should I? It's haunting me, but no one to confide. Who to pray to, the demons are sick of hearing me cry. I feel like I'm going to die inside, where all the agony lies. I just want it all to go away, the fear of losing my very own mind. Everything is tragedy that used to be fine, because now I don't know how to be myself. I don't know who I am. I feel lost, misspoken, a new identity to seize. Whoever I am or used to be, it's just not me. I'll never be someone. Please help me. Hi, everyone. I'm here to tell you about L.A. Not So Confidential, the forensic psychology and true crime podcast brought to you by me, Dr. Shiloh, and this guy. Hi, I'm her bestie and co-host, Dr. Scott. She was a cop and I was a Hollywood casting director. Now we're both forensic psychologists working in Los Angeles. We met while doing our internships working with sex offenders. I know, right? 
Twice a month, we bring you a classic or contemporary true crime story while applying real psychological concepts and dishing about entertainment's representations of those crimes. Subscribe now to L.A. Not So Confidential wherever you get your podcasts. True crime, psychology, and snark. Trust us. We're doctors.